It is a totalitarian belief. It is the wish to be a slave. It is the desire that there be an unalterable, unchallengeable, tyrannical authority who can convict you of thought crime while you are asleep, who can, can, who can subject you, who must indeed subject you, to a total surveillance around the clock every waking and sleeping minute of your life, I say of your life, before you're born and even worse than where the real fun begins after you're dead. <laughs> A celestial North Korea. <laughs> Who wants this to be true? Who but a slave desires such a ghastly fate? I've been to North Korea. It is the most revolting and utter and absolute and heartless tyranny the human species has ever Evolve, but at least you can fucking die and leave North Korea. <laughs> Perhaps the most unique and characteristic argument that Christopher Hitchens ever made about religion is his famous depiction of God as a celestial dictator. God doesn't exist, but even if he did, this would be a terrible injustice, since it would amount to us living under a tyrannical dictatorship comparable to living in North Korea. I remember being impressed by this argument when I first heard it, not least because it was usually presented as if it was part of a stand-up comedy routine. It's also terribly confronting. Why would we desire to be constantly surveilled? Why would anybody want there to be an unquestionable authority? But in the spirit of good faith, and in a continuing effort to distance myself from my wannabe Hitchens phase, I wanted to explore this particular argument and look at some of the ways that it might be responded to. I'm increasingly suspicious that it really works as an argument at all, and I think it might demonstrate both a misunderstanding of the wrongness of dictatorship and also the nature of God. But I'm not sure. We'll see how we do. To begin analysing this, we need to ask a question that might sound strange, but is very rarely asked in political conversation. What's actually wrong with dictatorship. But first, a word from today's video sponsor, Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a free email newsletter bringing you the latest in business, tech, and finance news every single morning, straight to your inbox, Monday through Sunday. Most of us tend to start our mornings aimlessly scrolling on social media, but by subscribing to Morning Brew, you'll have a concise, informative start to the day. You can read the whole thing in about five minutes, and it covers all of the latest developments in a witty and relevant style, unlike the dense and boring approach of traditional news media. I've been reading about everything from the increase of sightings of UFOs and the US government's response, to recent attempts to sue AI companies over AI-generated artwork, a fascinating debate about the nature of copyright. And Morning Brew is completely free. And it only takes about 15 seconds to subscribe, so there's really no reason not to do it if you're interested in business, tech, or finance. Just go to morningbrewdaily.com forward slash cosmic skeptic, or click the link in the description, or even scan the QR code that's on your screen. It's as simple as that, and you'll have a more informed start to your morning. Back to the video. Okay, so what's wrong with dictatorship? That is, if it is wrong, what makes it wrong? Why is it a bad idea to give a single individual ultimate authority over the affairs of citizens and the laws that govern them? After all, throughout history and in some places today, people have been highly receptive to dictatorships. They can have considerable public support. They're a more stable form of government than one that can completely change every few years. They're also seen as more effective at getting things done compared to the long and drawn-out process of debating legislation and elections and democracy. Order! 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 I must ask the honourable gentleman, order! As has sometimes been said of the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, he made the trains run on time. In Plato's Republic, a foundational philosophical text that imagines a hypothetical perfect city-state, we're introduced to the concept of a philosopher king, 
who Plato thought was the best possible leader of this perfect republic. This would not be someone who is elected by the people, but rather someone trained from birth to have a genuine knowledge of truth and goodness, which makes them best placed to rule a nation. They're not corrupt, they're not trying to impress, they're just actually the best people for the job. This sounds a lot like dictatorship. So what's the problem with this? Ideally, we would have a dictator who knows what's best for his or her citizens, cares for the interests of those citizens, has a good understanding of truth and goodness, and takes decisive action in producing the best and most stable society. This would be far better and simpler to live under than Trump versus Biden, and unending election campaigns, you know, voting for the legislature and the president, and council elections, mayoral elections. Ugh. Of course it would. Of course this would be better. But the problem is that this is a pipe dream. Few, if any, human beings are capable in practice of being such a dictator. Indeed, even Plato recognizes that whilst philosopher kings are hypothetically the ideal rulers, it's not obvious that they could actually exist in practice. The problem with dictatorship is the fallibility of the dictator. Sure, a perfect dictator sounds fantastic, but of course dictators are also humans, and humans are simply never perfect. Because of this, in practice, dictatorships are prone to falling into disaster. Without sufficient means to hold one to account, a dictator can exercise cruel and arbitrary power. He can become tyrannical and oppressive. He can be corrupt or malicious or both. And even if we find a dictator with genuinely pure intentions, he can still simply get things factually wrong, make a mistake, and accidentally lead his country into ruin because nobody could stop him. These are the fears that compel people to reject dictatorship. The Americans overthrew the British monarchy because the monarch was unjustly taxing them. The Allies overthrew Nazism because Hitler was a murderous, cruel expansionist. The true evil of dictatorship always lies in the evil of the dictator. But what if we could have a perfect dictator? What if we could be governed by a being who was genuinely perfect? Hopefully you can see the point by now. If the problem with dictatorship in the first place is the fallibility and corruptibility and imperfection of the dictator, then a necessarily infallible and incorruptible and perfect dictator would seemingly not be something to worry about, at least not in the same way. And this seems to me the problem with Christopher Hitchens drawing an analogy between human beings and God. Remember, you might think that the idea of God is silly or that God doesn't exist, but Hitchens isn't arguing about the existence of God. He's just saying that if it were the case that such a God existed, it would be a bad thing. But if the reason it would be a bad thing is because it would be analogous to a dictatorship, then when we consider that what it is that seems to make human dictatorships evil and wrong is something about being human, that is, corruptibility, evil, malice, if these things don't apply to God, then the analogy simply doesn't work. Indeed, if there were a person who genuinely knew with 100% certainty, infallibly, what was best for you, better than you could ever hope to know yourself, and genuinely wanted the best for you, and gave you commands and guidance about how to live in the best possible way, then provided this person is genuinely infallible and genuinely benevolent, it would be perfectly irrational not to do everything that person told you to. And this, of course, is a description of God, an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving being who actually knows what's best for you and actually wants it. Of course, you could respond that the gods of world religions are not perfectly moral, they're not benevolent, like the Christian God commanding genocide in the Old Testament or condemning homosexuals and the like. But Hitchens isn't making a point about a particular God. He's making the point that, in principle, the existence of an omniscient god, in general, is a terrible thing. Hitchens is claiming that even the existence of the god that Christians claim to believe in, that is, one who is triomni, meaning omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, would be a terrible tyranny. That just seems to me to misunderstand what it is that makes dictatorship so unfavorable. We can see this in how Hitchens casually conflates dictatorship with tyranny, and treats them as if they mean the same thing when they don't. A dictator is simply someone who has absolute power over a country. 
A tyrant is someone who exercises that power in a cruel and oppressive or unreasonable or arbitrary manner. If a perfect god existed, then even if he could be described as a dictator, it would be difficult to describe him as a tyrant, since a loving god would certainly not be cruel and oppressive, and it would be impossible for him to be unreasonable, being a perfectly rational being. Once you're talking about God, you're no longer talking about a being who is susceptible to the things that make dictatorships tyrannical. And just before we move on, here's something interesting for you. Just listen to the following exchange between Christopher Hitchens and a radio host. So what if God actually exists, sir? Would he not have been good to you? No. Uh, he wouldn't. Because if that were true, it would mean that I had an eternal supervising parent who would never die and let me get on with my life, never let me grow up, who keep me under surveillance. But you have, sir. And supervision every, every minute of my but, life. But and you constantly have. Asked, and constantly asked me to be thanking and praising him. Yeah. I well, think it would that be wasn't part like, of the scenario. It would be like living in North Korea. I, I, I think it would be a horrible outcome. Well, not sure that, that, that God is Kim Jong-il, but what if what I said is well, true? Well, Kim Jong-il, he has a different opinion. A classic and underrated hitch slap. But it also seems to sum up the point that I'm trying to make here. To risk killing the joke by dissecting the frog, Hitchens is of course mocking Kim Jong-il for thinking he's some kind of god in the way that he acts and behaves. And that's precisely the problem with dictatorships. Human beings attempting to hold an office that could only be reasonably held by a god. Isn't that interesting? But okay, isn't there another problem to deal with here? Sure, okay, it would be in our interests to follow the dictates of a perfect god. But what of freedom? Isn't that important too? Even if going against God's guidance would ultimately be bad for us, shouldn't we be free to make that choice for ourselves? Isn't always doing what somebody else tells us incompatible with freedom? Hitchens seems to think so. Um, I'd say that to me that what matters most is the pursuit of happiness in the words of our greatest founding father, uh, and the pursuit of liberty, freedom, and that these things are incompatible, completely incompatible with the worship of an unalterable celestial dictator. That makes the concept of the pursuit of freedom and happiness completely negative, it negates it. But I'm not so sure that this would be the case just because theism is true. After all, the mere existence of a god who watches over everything and tells you that certain things are right and others are wrong does not remove your freedom to act as you please. You can still freely choose to do whatever you like, it's just that the existence of a god would mean that whatever you do is noticed, and perhaps appropriately punished or rewarded. Now, Hitchens would probably respond to this by saying that actually, yes, you are essentially forced to act in a particular way, because god threatens you with hellfire if you don't do so. Not imposed? Did you really say not imposed? What if you reject this offer? What are you told by what have you been told for centuries by Christians? If you reject this offer that took place by means of a torture to death of a human being that you didn't want and should have prevented if you could. What if you reject the offer? If you, if you, if you accept it, you can have eternal life and your sins are forgiven. Oh, great. What a horrible way to abolish your own responsibility and get your own bliss. I don't want it. Oh, you don't? Well, then you can go to hell. This is not imposed? This is perhaps the most important consideration of this video, in that a lot hinges on it. In my view, if hell does exist, and it is a place of infinite torment as a punishment for rejecting God, then I think Hitchens is quite right to say that this is enforcement, and it does negate human freedom. You're not really acting freely if you've been threatened to act in a particular way. It would be like a thief saying, sure, you can choose not to give me your wallet if you want, but I will shoot you in the head if you don't. Your decision. You're not really being offered a choice here. But this simply isn't the only conception of what hell is. And something which Hitchens needs to consider is that you can be a theist without having this conception of hell, or indeed, without thinking hell exists at all. For many theists, hell is not primarily punitive. It's not some kind of way for God to get back at you for the wrong things that you've done in your life. Indeed, that doesn't make much sense given that God can't be harmed in any way by the behaviour of humans. Instead, hell is thought of as simply the natural result of sin. Hell just represents a separation from God. It's not some literal place of flames and torture. 
It's just wherever souls go that don't want union with God. And maybe you think that this view of hell is mistaken, but there are a great deal of theists who believe in it. And if you don't like it, consider that there are a lot of theists who don't believe in hell at all, or think that hell is merely a metaphor. If I were religious, I think I'd be inclined towards a position called annihilationism, the view that if you don't go to heaven, you simply cease to exist altogether. And one of the reasons that I think this is that religious philosophy often posits God as the ground of all being. In the contingency argument, he's put forward as the necessary foundation of everything that exists, without which nothing else could exist. And so to reject union with him or to go somewhere where he is not after you die would be to reject being itself and cease to exist because you wouldn't have a ground for your existence anymore. But just imagine for a moment that hell is simply the natural result of sin, something that God essentially can't help. It's just somewhere people send themselves by not living a spiritually good life due to their free will. As C.S. Lewis famously said, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. Or suppose hell doesn't exist. Or suppose hell is just a metaphor, a representation of the disastrous earthly consequences of wrong or misguided behavior. And suppose that whatever this hell is, it's a fate that God desperately wants you to avoid. His provision of rules and laws would then not be so much a set of authoritarian dictates, but rather an omniscient guide to getting the best possible outcome for yourself that he's giving you because he wants the best for yourself. It would be like me going to my friend who's depressed and out of shape and sleeping terribly and their life is just a misery right now. I might bang on their door and rather sternly tell them, look, you need to start waking up at 7 a.m., getting some exercise, eating properly and sleeping better. Put your phone down, delete TikTok and get outside. If you don't, you're going to end up in hell. You're going to be anxious and sad. You're going to be out of shape and addicted to social media and isolated and jobless. And believe me, you don't want that. This isn't me being a dictator, threatening my friend to act how I want him to act. This is me telling my friend how to actualize his potential and free himself from a self-inflicted hell that he doesn't even realize he's falling into and won't be able to fully understand until he tries following my advice. Indeed, there's a strange paradox in how by restricting the number of options available to himself, by deleting TikTok and not allowing himself to stay up late, etc., he actually makes himself more free, not less by placing these restrictions on himself. And if these kinds of rules and this kind of advice could be provided not by me to my friend, but by an omniscient authority who knows better than you do how to achieve the best outcome for yourself, then this might not best be depicted as a constraining, tyrannical dictatorship, but rather guidance on how to become truly free. Telling a sinner not to sin might be like telling a smoker not to smoke. If somebody has a nicotine addiction and this addiction is constraining their life and preventing them from freely doing what it is that they want to do, especially if the smoker doesn't know that smoking is unhealthy or doesn't realize it, somebody telling them to stop smoking might seem tyrannical and unjust and a constraint on their freedom. But it's at least possible that this order is being given not to constrain, but in an attempt to liberate. Please follow my advice, do as I say, for your own sake. And at least under one interpretation, this is what's going on with religious law, but because it's coming from an omniscient authority, you can always trust that this being knows what's best for you and has your best interests at heart. This would mean that by committing yourself to following his commands about how to best live your life, you're not making yourself less free, but more free because you're allowing yourself, in the sense of positive liberty described by Isaiah Berlin, to achieve self-actualization and self-mastery in the way that by preventing oneself from smoking a cigarette might make them become more free because the addiction was constraining them. Of course, I don't think that sin exists in a religious sense, and I think that the sins described by particular world religions are quite ridiculous. But in principle, the idea that there could be things that we're doing that are ultimately bad, but we don't either realize that they're bad or we kind of have a compulsion to do them anyway. And the idea that following someone's guidance or commands to stop doing them, despite how much we might really want to, would actually be better for us and actually give us more freedom rather than less, I think is at least consistent. For a better understanding of a religious perspective on this issue, I recently spoke to Bishop Robert Barron, 
and I'll play you an excerpt of our conversation in which we discussed this particular issue. You might understand why Christopher Hitchens describes God as a tyrant, because of course, you know, God is the is the great ground of all being, but there's this idea that if you don't accept this, or if you put a foot wrong, or if you do the wrong thing, you get punished, yeah, but, and in but, such a way that even if you do it inside your own head, you you have no, this don't... this force that can punish you for it. Doesn't that seem <laughs> no, but, tyrannical that, to you? Yeah, that does, but that's not the right way to look at it. Because, see, here's something very important philosophically: that God doesn't need us. God needs nothing. God is God. The world adds nothing to God's greatness. It's a very important th- theological idea. God doesn't need my moral perfection. God doesn't need anything from me. God needs nothing from me. So oh, God's offended by what I... No, that's a psychologized sort of symbol of what we're talking about. God, the anger of God in the Bible, I would translate as God's passion to set things right. God hates the fact that I'm not alive and he hates what, what I've done to myself and he wants that over. He wants to burn that away. And so the divine anger, the divine punishment, if we psychologize it as some you know, Kim Jong-un punishing his, his rivals, that's not it at all. It's God desiring, in fact, going all the way into our dysfunction, all the way down, so that he might draw us out of it. For me, I think that the problem with tyranny is the tyrant. The, the reason why tyranny is bad, the reason why it's bad to have an authoritarian dictator is because of the corruptibility of human beings. It seems to me that if there were a person or a being who genuinely knew you better than you knew yourself, genuinely wanted the best for you, and genuinely knew how to get the best for you, then it would be perfectly irrational for you to not do what they say all the time. And that this shouldn't be described as tyranny, but rather something like genuine, enlightened advice that you would be foolish not to take. Right. That's why the psalmist can say, you know, Lord, I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. The law is not some imposition on me. I love your law. It's like a... When you're learning how to play golf and someone's giving you proper instruction and it's getting into your body and now you know how to hit the darn ball. I, I love the law. Give me more of it. Give me more of the law of golf. And I'm, if I'm living just in my own space, I'm going to golf any way I want to. I'll be the worst golfer in the world, right? So th- that's a better metaphor for like religious law. And that's why when the Lord says, I will write the law in your heart, that's like a golfer. I finally got it in my body. I finally have the laws in my body. So that's what God wants to do. He wants to write the moral law in my in my heart. In a sense, you actually become more free by restricting the amount of things that you can do. Yeah, and see, freedom is a great spiritual metaphor up and down the tradition because our attachments make us unfree. And when I'm freed from my attachments, I'm freed for that thing we first talked about. This realm of objective value begins to open up to me in a fresh way. As long as I'm in my little world and I'm hung up on how do people think about me and how am I doing and then I never, the world of objective value doesn't open up to me. It's like light pollution. I never see the stars. But when I get rid of all that clutter and and distraction, I can actually see the stars. Mm. And this is what the the tyrant of Christopher Hitchens' description is actually doing. It's not do this or else I'm going to punish you, but do this because this is the right thing for you. Trust me, do this and, and things will clear away that will enable you, a whole world to open up to you. That would be the, the right way to read it. So let me know what you think. Is God a dictator? And if so, is that necessarily a bad thing? Are his laws threatening dictates? Or are they guidance and advice from someone who truly wants the best for you? Let me know what you think in the comments. I've been Alex O'Connor. I wanna thank as always my top tier supporters on Patreon for helping keep this channel alive. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.